Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking and today we're going to talk about medieval history again and particularly about the Normans. Now, first things first. Um, let's begin with the name, Normans. Now, the English word Normans came from French, okay? In, in French you say Normand. Now, what's interesting about this, this word is the meaning and then where it comes from. So, the meaning is, as it suggests, men from the north. Now, this could be a deceiving information because um, where is Normandy? In the north of France. But that doesn't mean that Normans were men from the north of France. Initially, the meaning was men from the north of Europe because that's where the Normans originated, from Scandinavia. But we will, we will get to that point when we will start talking about history of the Normans itself. But for now, let's just understand the name. So yes, Norman, men from the north, north men. It makes sense from an English point of view. But what's interesting, if you think about it, is that it actually um, comes from French. And in French, a man is homme. Um. So, and north is nord. So why didn't they call them oh, Narom, for example, or Nordom, something like that? Why man, if that's not a French word? How can it, can it originate in French? Well, that's why I don't like it when they say that it, it comes from the old French word. Well, the thing is more complex than that. Now, it's true that in French, now you say Normand with a little D at the end. In old French, you would spell it with a T at the end, um, and which is... But the sound is still the same. Well, you know how French is a beautiful language, but, you know, the letters at the end sometimes, they give me this impression that they are just a decoration. Like, you know, let's put a T there. No, let's just put an X. It looks better. All right, then, fine with me. Obviously, I'm joking. But, yeah, the, the sound will remain the same. Um, the thing is that uh, the word, the French as a language, the way we perceive it now is a Latin language. Um, why? Because, obviously, it was created by the merging of the already existing languages in the Roman province of Gallia and the Latin language. And that created the Romance language we now consider and call French. But uh, before that, in the kingdom of the Franks, you spoke Fran Frankish. Okay? Now, Frankish, obviously, it was not a Latin language. It was a Germanic language. And as a matter of fact, a man in German, even today, is Man, okay, with two N. So, going back to the, to the word Norman, so now that makes us understand that the word was originated by, it was by using old Frankish words put together, and then it remained within, it, it, it stayed there within the French language, and then it was lent to, to English, okay? So, the men from the north, men from Scandinavia, that's the meaning of Norman. Moving to the history. The Normans descend from the Vikings. Now, there are books, not really books, but sometimes I read and I hear people uh, referring to both the Normans and the Vikings as if they were the same thing. Personally, I don't think they were the same thing, and I will explain why. Um, the, the Vikings, we, I will talk about the Vikings specifically in another video, but what I would like to say here is the fact that the Vikings were sailor men, um, sailors and formidable sailors and incredible warriors, ragers of cities and monasteries. That's what they did. They did it in Britain, in Great Britain already. And, and then they eventually reached um, northern France, hungry for land, for wealth, for power, for riches. Now, this happened in 880. That's when they reached northern France. Now, when we say the Vikings, we need to understand that it's not just one population reaching northern France, but there were quite a few populations from Norway, from, from uh, Denmark, and, and, and there were quite a few populations, some of among which there were the actual Vikings, some of which were under Viking control, the Norse, for example. There were quite a few. The Norse were from, from Norway. Norway, Norway. So it was a Norwegian population. So there were quite a few, okay, quite a few groups, and all coming from that area of the north. Now, 
as they reached northern France, what did they, what did they find? Well, the area they reached um, was an area where basically the, the north of, of the current France, but it was also the part that the, the Romans referred to as the Roman province of Gallia, of part of Gallia Lugdurensis. Okay. Now, the political situation was a disaster. Um, it was not the, the, the time where of Charlemagne and the unity were long gone. At that time, there were just the remains of, there were quite a few principalities. Um, and so the situation was really fragmented. From fragmented. Uh, the whole kingdom, the whole idea was, was kind of, a, of that of a of a kingdom with a king, who was King Charles at the time, um, King Charles III, to be more specific, as I like to be very specific, um, who was a, a leader with very little authority. Okay? Now, they found this, and what else did they find? They find a land rich of game for hunting, of rivers and waters filled with, with fishes, and so they craved it. Now, what we, so that led to the, to the treaty, the very famous treaty, which began the Duchy of Normandy between the, the king, King Charles, the King of France, or the Franks, okay, and one of, well, the most important uh, of, the, of the originally Viking leaders, who was um, Rollo, or, or uh, if you want to pronounce it the English way, that would be Royaux if you want to pronounce it the French way. Now, before starting talking about this, why did the king decide to, um, to sign a treaty, to give them land, to give them permission to stay? There's one thing we need to understand. The Normans were unstoppable. They were, at that time of fragmentation, no one could stand the Normans. No one could stand and fight the Normans. They were too well organized. They were too strong of warriors. And what they did, they kept on taking land and places. Then they started kidnapping people. They started taking people. They started taking whatever they wanted. And, and so the king had to make a treaty. Now, so this treaty was made that all the territory, beginning at the, the river Ept, or saint clair sur Ept, to be more precise, all the way up, North, north, towards the north, reaching the sea. All that area would have been the area of the Normans. So the idea is this king saying, well, this is what I have, I don't want to lose it, just give them that land over there and, and let them stay there. Okay, so they have what they want, I have what I, what I want. So Rollo accepted and eventually Normandy was born. Now, an interesting episode that we need to consider, and an interesting fact that we need to consider, is how and who this Rollo was. Rollo is described as being a giant, a terrible fighter, so big that he could never and could not ride a horse. There was no war horse that could stand him, so he was also called, sometimes, Rollo the Walker, because he wouldn't ride, he couldn't horseback. And he was a man of, of interesting, of an interesting, a very typical Nordic personality and strength. In fact, there was a, a he even refused to kneel down and kiss the king's feet during the treaty, which was the um, the custom at the time. And he ordered one of his servants to do so. And as the servant approached the King Charles' feet, he lifted the foot and then rolled him over. That was to show that the Duke Rollo did not want to kneel down to any authority. So the King of France, King Charles, was almost a puppet. Okay, so that was the idea. He did not have much authority, particularly over the Normans. So in 911, Normandy, the Duchy of Normandy, one of the greatest fiefs of medieval France, was born. Now, what's interesting about the Normans is the way they adapted to local society. They settled down. From sailors and warriors, they became, um, they organized an agricultural 
um, society, an even more functional hierarchical system. Another important factor was their conversion to Christianity. So they abandoned the old Norse gods and they started, they became Christians. Um, this was obviously a political step towards integration. So that was what, what was, was what they did, the Normans. They would go to a local area, take the language, take the local customs and merge with the local population, intermarrying, for example. That was something that was done quite a lot. As a matter of fact, even Rollo intermarried with one of the daughters coming from the Frankish aristocracy. The legend says that in 1027, a young lady by the name of Eleva had a dream. In that dream, she saw a branch sprouting from her belly, towering all of Normandy and England. She was to have a child, William the Bastard, who will reach historical immortality with the name of William the Conqueror, Duke of Normandy and future King of England. The legend is interesting. It was obviously written a hundred years later that, that event. But what helps us understand is that this son of Eleva and the younger brother of the Duke of Normandy uh, was to become a national hero. For what? All of this will lead to the most famous date in English history, 1066, the Battle of Hastings. Now, I will talk specifically about the Battle of Hastings in details in another video, uh, but what today we want to understand is how the Normans invading England, this invasion of the Normans going to England, will change and shape dramatically not only European history, but the world's history. Now, um, in, so in 1066, William the Conqueror, William, Duke William II, who was also called William the Conqueror, decided that he was the rightful heir to the throne of England. In England instead, after the death of the king, um, Harold II decided to crown himself the, lo the lawful successor. Now, both the noblemen said that they had received letters from the king uh, and that they were the chosen ones. Now, which was true, we don't really know. But what really matters is that as the Normans arrived in England, they had this huge battle against the um, local Saxon forces led by, by King Harold II and obviously that battle was won by the Normans who then replaced the local Saxon aristocracy with Norman and therefore French aristocracy, Northern, because now the Normans had become a different ethnic group, a completely different culture. They were not Scandinavians anymore, they were local French, basically, who were different from the French from certain point of views, but still, you know, they drank wine, they spoke French, so there wasn't much difference anyways, they hadn't mingled. First of all, how did they, how, why were they so unstoppable? Well, one of the main things about the Normans was their mounted cavalry, their mounted forces. Um, the Normans would use mail armour, the Norman helmet, this one here, as you can see behind me. Obviously that's why it's called Norman helmet. I also have a video about this, specifically the Norman helmet. If you haven't um, checked it out, please, please do so. And, uh, and then, then they fought with oval shields, very big shields and swords. Talking about cavalry, after we will have a little wearing time for this video as well, a little bonus wearing time, and or even though I'm not specifically talking about any specific kind of armour, I want to have a, a wearing time where I will talk, I will dress up like a Norman, and I will talk specifically about what it meant to be a knight at the time of the Normans. But let's move forward for now, so look forward for that. The language that we refer to today as English is the merging of two languages, the Saxon original language of the 
area of Britannia and the Norman French, right? Now we can see this, we, we, and that, so that's why even if English is not a Latin language, it's a Germanic language because there are a lot of words like good morning that sounds like German, guten Morgen, and for example man means, as I said, man in German, or water becomes Wasser. So there are quite a few, quite a few words that sound the same. Okay, so you can definitely spot that it's a Germanic language. However, over 60 to 70 percent of the vocabulary comes from Latin roots. And that's for two reasons. One was because Britannia for over 300 years was under Roman control, so that already kind of put in some words and terms. But then it was the Normans who really gave it all its Latin inherited. But what happened is really interesting because it's different from how, for example, Spanish, French and Italian and Portuguese are, and Romanian, are actually Latin languages. In England it's interesting, in English it's interesting because you, you often have two separate, distinct words meaning the same thing. I'll give you some examples now. For example, for words that have to do with everyday things, water, eat, drink, you can easily see that they come from German, so the original Anglo-Saxon words. Um, because in German you say trinken to say drink, you say essen to say eat, and you can understand eat, ate, eaten. Now eaten kind of sounds like essen, okay? Um, or for example hound, another way to say dog in English, where in German you say hund. So there are quite a few. But when you start talking about um, political things, you see politics, in Italian for example, politica, or, for example, let's say, aristocracy. So all these words, which come from, from, from Latin and then from the Normans, obviously, are ours generated by our society and the Norman aristocracy, again. So bureaucracy, for example, all these words are Latin because they come from, from that point of view, from that culture, the Norman culture. Um, and that's the same for a lot of Christian words, all coming from that in heritage, okay? Now, so as, I, as I mentioned though, sometimes we have both words. So let's have a look at some of these. Um, for example, when you talk about the animal, in English you say pig. Pig, now that's obviously the Germanic root. But when you talk about the food you eat, you say pork. That's obviously, the, and that comes from the Norman word, okay, from the French word. Even in Italian we can say porco to say, to say pig. It's not a very nice way to say it actually in Italian, but yeah, that's beyond the point. Um, now, why is there this, this distinction? Because the Saxons were, were peasants, were farmers, so their words were those that had to do with the animals and, and things that they had, you know, close. But in the Middle Ages, not many people could afford to eat meat so, to do that. Who were the rich? The Normans, the nobles. So they had their word and the word became English. Within the walls of these chambers I shall find rest, and, if I so chose, resume my journey as my fatigue diminished. Within the walls of these rooms I shall find respite, and, if I so chose, resume my journey as my weariness abated. So, what was a Norman knight? As I said, Normans wore mail, mostly, and these kind of helmets, and they used swords and overly shaped shields. Now, a Norman, the concept of knight and knighthood was very different in the early Middle Ages. The idea of the romantic knight, the knight with lance, the knight with honor codes, saving princes and all these things. This is a very medieval thing, perhaps high medieval thing, but not early medieval thing. At the time of the Normans, a knight would only be a mounted warrior who had enough money to afford a war, a war horse. So that was a knight. And uh, so it was completely different from the, for the future. The, the concept of of a knight with all the romantic thing is something that comes after the Crusades, okay? So it kind of starts with the Templars from a religious point of view and with knights on, on the other hand who were not religious but still had all those codes 
and uh, and deeds, and then which actually linked the concept of a knight with that of nobility. But that's something that happens after this. So the and the Norman warriors were so strong, particularly the knights, that they were also um, hired as, for example, in the Byzantine Empire. Thank you very much for watching, as always, and please share this video. If you liked it, um, please thumb up. If you like this video, please thumb up and subscribe to my channel. Also, share this video with on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, whatever you want. And remember that Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.